Dismiss at this time. I want you to open your Bibles up to two places, Matthew chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 11. Matthew chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 11. Turn that down just a titch, uh, Jay, would you please? Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. My message is entitled, Real Wise Men Still Seek Him. Real wise men still seek him. This is part two of a message I began last week. This is our New Year's message. So I want you to pay close attention because it applies to each and every person that's here today, and of course those who will watch us by television. Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now I'll go over to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Real wise men still seek him. Our Father and our God, we exalt you this morning. We praise you, Lord God. We pray that your presence, your power, your spirit would be present here today. And Father, you take your infallible word and stir up our hearts and stir up our minds and stir up our soul and spirit. And Lord, we apply these things to our lives and we feel the hand of the living God upon us before we leave here today. Father, I pray you to anoint this preacher with feet of clay. Give me physical strength this morning, I pray, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I told you my message this morning is real wise men still seek him. Real wise men still seek him. You may be seated. Okay. I want you to stand up all through the sermon. But beloved... The New Year's resolution that you made this year was that you were going to diligently seek the Lord. The Holy Spirit calls these men wise men, not because they were smart or intelligent or they invented some cure for something, but because they followed Balaam's prophecy. All the way back yonder in the Old Testament, Balaam had prophesied that there was going to come a star out of Jacob and a scepter or a king that would rise out of Israel. So with a little information that they had, they followed that star and went right to the house where Jesus was staying. Now, it didn't go to the uh, uh, manger, as a lot of people think. It was about two years later. And that star settled over the house. Jesus was about two years old at that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the wise men came and they presented their gifts unto the Lord. But the Bible says they came and they worshipped him. Would you say amen out there? And it's vitally important that you study next week. If you get this series, you need last week's uh, uh, message to go with this, beloved. Because there's a lot of truths in there that I cannot repeat today. Because I want to move on and finish this sermon. But it's vitally important that we understand what it means to diligently seek the Lord. Now, the reason that is so important is this. I believe, with all my heart, I told you last week that the Holy Spirit really wants to bless somebody here today. He wants to fill you, but you have to pray and cry out, Oh God, oh God, bless me today. I want your hand upon me. I want to change my life. I truly do. And when you do that, the Bible says what you're doing is diligently seeking the Lord. Now notice what it says in Hebrews eleven six again. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now that word diligently seek, I told you, is one word in the Greek, exiteo, and it's a present tense verb. The word ek meaning out is in the exit right here. And of course, uh, the, whereas the suffix zeteo means to constantly and continuously seek and seek after God, to be striving, to look out for him, look about for him, beloved. It means to exhaustively do everything you can to find out about who this God is and about what he is and what he wants to do. That's what it means to cometh to God. Notice that verb, cometh. He didn't came to God. The Bible says he that cometh to God, he keeps on coming and keeps on coming and keeps on diligently seeking. And then 
In Hebrews 11, 6, C, if you look at the bottom part, is a rewarder, mistapodudotes. It means that he is a remunerator, uh, a repair. It means he's a recompenser. The Greek, the Greek literally means he's a tipper. I don't mean this way, okay? <laughs> he's a payer, meaning he's a payer of those who will diligently come to him, that will want to make and take him the Lord of their life, to make his ways, their ways. Would you say amen out there? You know, when I printed out my sermon last week, one page came out right, the other one came up upside down. <laughs> so I have to remind the turner this way now. <laughs> but anyways, brother, what I'm saying to you is simply this here, that I told you last week that we need five ways to, the scripture is clear on this, about diligently seek him. Now, for brevity of time, I'm not going to take you to a lot of scriptures. The scriptures that I know, that I've memorized, I will quote them to you. You can write them down, look them up later. But the first thing I want you to see, beloved, is this here. You need to seek, diligently seek God in worship. Now, listen to me. We take that for granted many times. The word worship, proskuneo, it means to kiss the hand, to bow the knee as a token of your reverence and respect as a sign of homage or veneration to God. Another translation, it means to lip, uh, lap the hand like a dog would lap the hand out of affection for his master. That's what the word means, to, to worship God. Now, beloved, listen to me now. Worship of God is not just something you do on the Sabbath. It is to be not only a public practice on the Sabbath, but it is to be a private practice every single day of your life. Would you say amen out there? Now, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, as we just read it, that the wise men can bearing gifts to diligently seek the Lord in worship, and they wanted to worship him as king of the Jews. And when they came, they did not come empty-handed. In other words, the Bible says that they came bearing gifts. And when we come to God and worship, we must come bearing gifts. Would you say amen out there? I'll talk a little bit about that more as I go along. But the wise men bowed down before him in holy awe. Do you do that? The wise men bow down before him, beloved, in holy reverence and obeisance and obedience to the Lord as their king. And they said, Lord, we believe that you are the king of the Jews, and we present these gifts to you. You know, a lot of us come empty-handed before the Lord, don't we? We get so enthralled with the gifts that we're not thankful to the giver. We get so enthralled with the rewards that we're not enthralled with the rewarder. And we need to learn, beloved, that the first thing is to worship him who is the rewarder, to worship him who is the gifts, before we worship the gifts that we get from God. We'll just say amen out there. Now, beloved, a lot of people who call themselves Christians refuse to submit and surrender to the Lord as their king. And that's why, as you study the Gospels, Jesus said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I ask. In other words, all you're doing is lying to me. You're calling me Lord, but I'm not your Lord. You're calling me Master, but I'm not your Master. You're your own Lord, you're your own Master, but the wise men came bearing gifts to him as their Lord and Master. Come on and say amen out there. And so, beloved, these wise men, I told you, diligently sought the Lord. They traveled over 50 1,500 hard and harrowing miles so they could worship the Lord. You can't get people to drive 20 miles to come to church anymore. Oh, it's too tired. I'm too lazy. It's too cold out there. You know what? I'm this and that and the other thing. I, I got a sniffle. So what? I've had sniffles and been behind the pulpit. So you need to come and worship the Lord. Would you say amen out there? So they came and they brought gifts. That was awfully nice of them, wasn't it? You see, in them days, you didn't come before royalty, ladies and gentlemen, unless you brought some kind of gift to them to show their appreciation, your, your reverence or respect toward them. Now, you say to me, Pastor, what gift can I personally ever give to the Lord? Now, that's a good question, isn't it? I mean, that's something I would ask. <laughs> what gift can I really give the Lord? I mean, I know at Christmas I got a lot of gifts. People are always giving me gifts. 
In fact, I come to the house of God so I can get a gift of blessing today. How about giving a gift of blessing today? I'm hoping I'm giving you a gift of blessing. How about you giving me one? Would you say amen out there? Now you say, Pastor, what gift can I give the Lord? Well, beloved, you need to give him the gift of your heart. God has told you before, God says, my son, give me thine heart. If I got your heart, I got your money. If I got your heart, I've got your house. If I got your heart, I've got your car. If I got your heart, I've got your dedication. If I got your heart, I've got your devotion. Would you say amen? You can give him the gift, listen to me now, of your will. I want my will to bend your way, Lord. You can give him the gift of your life, ladies and gentlemen, and your lips and your own body. Paul said to the church at Rome, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he said this. He says, I beseech thee therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's the least that you can do for everything he's done for him. Now, if I were going to teach this theologically to you, if I wouldn't a seminary class, uh, Romans chapter 1, right through uh, verse 8, is... is um, Doctrinal. You learn about justification, condemnation, glorification, sanctification. Romans uh, 9 to 11 is dispensational, having to deal with the nation of Israel. And uh, Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 2 16 is uh, deportmental. How I live in light of everything God has done for me. So when Paul's saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Uh, uh, under God, he says, as a reasonable service, he's saying that's the least that you can do because you were condemned and God justified you. Because you were uh, uh, condemned and God sanctified you. And God says he's going to glorify you. So those are the gifts he gave to you, so the least you can do now is give, your, uh, give him your heart so you can worship him in spirit and in truth. Would you say amen out there? God says if you do that, now, you're truly worshiping me. So, beloved, the question is, have you ever personally presented your body as a living sacrifice to God as an act of worship? Have you ever told the Lord you give and live your life for him? Everything that you do will be centered around him. Beloved, I've tried to make it a point in my life, honestly. I, I'm not saying I'm perfect at this, but... Is, more often than not, I ask God everything. Lord, you want me to do that? You want me to do this? You want me to do this? You want me to do that? Say, I want to do the Lord's will. I want his guidance. I want him involved in my life. How about you? That's worshiping God. We have the idea that we have to do worship God is just come in and sing him, sit down, hear a sermon. No, that's true. That's true. That's worship. But also, worship must exceed the doors of the sanctuary. Amen. It must be in everything you do, everything you say. Remember, you're presenting your body a living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable unto God. Now, am I supposed to present him a dirty body? Am I supposed to pre present him something that's unacceptable? Is that what God is saying? No, the Holy Spirit, Spirit says that it's holy and it's acceptable unto God. Beloved, have you ever personally just lifted up your heart and hands and said to God, Lord... I want to live my life in such a way that it will bring great worship to you. It will bring great glory and praise and honor to you, oh my Father and God. I want to diligently seek you as my Savior. I want to diligently seek you as my Lord. I want to diligently seek you as my King and my Master in my life. Have you ever said that, beloved? I hope you have. You know, everything else is pales in comparison to that. Any New Year's resolution you have ever made uh, pales in compar uh, comparison to that. That's all, folks. <laughs> it pales in comparison to that, beloved. God has created us for his good pleasure so we can worship him. Would you say amen? Have you ever said, Lord, I want to have a closer and more intimate personal and intimate sold out relationship with you this year and learn how to love you and worship you with all of my heart and with all of my mind and with all of my soul and with all of my uh, uh, strength. Jesus said that was the greatest commandment of the law, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, beloved, that doesn't come easy. 
A love relationship takes time. I know it does with my wife and I over 52 years. It takes time to be able to build up, build up. And I don't know if she still loves me or not, but... <laughs> But you learn more and more about each and every person. Amen. Uh, and, and beloved, it strengthens, it deepens that love that you have. And so Jesus isn't saying, ipso facto, bing, bang, boom, that's it. You're going to love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But what he's saying is, I want you to look at your life. I want you to see what I have done for you since the day you bowed the knee to me. How I've cleaned up your life. How I've blessed you in your life. Oh, I put food on the table. I've put a roof over your head. I've given you a family. I've given you friends. I've given you a church. So I want you to look at that and present yourself to me. Give me your heart. So you can love me with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Because Jesus said the Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. He's seeking after those. <clears throat> Excuse me. That will do that. Amen. I'm saying that you're a real wise man if you constantly and continuously seek the Lord in worship daily. What did I say? Daily, beloved, throughout this coming new year, and not just on Sabbath, and not just occasionally, beloved, amen. Our worship is to be a daily private one and a weekly public one as we congregate in the house of God on Sabbath. So that's the first thing I want you to see. We diligently seek him, how? In worship. Say it again. I seek the Lord in what? In worship. I seek the Lord in worship. Number two, beloved. We ought to seek him, seek his word in our life. Seek his what? Word in our life. Now, beloved, scripture calls you a real wise man if you diligently seek to know God's word. Now in Psalm 119, 89, the Bible says this, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The Bible, now listen to me, is the preserved word of God. I don't have time to even go into what that entails. But the Bible is the preserved word of God, beloved. It is the plenary. That means the full. The plenary the inerrant, verbally inspired, infallible, eternal word of God, and Jesus is the eternal logos. He's the eternal word and wisdom of God incarnate. He's the incarnate word. So what am I teaching you? Both of these are inseparably connected, the word and Jesus. You see, beloved, both of these are consecrated. The Bible is the inspired word of God. Jesus is the what? Incarnate word of God. So we just can't take this Bible lightly as we look into it and we have it on our shelf and we can't let dust collect on it, beloved, because you have to hear what God has to say to you on a daily basis, amen? If you really want to know him, if you really want to diligently seek him this year. Now, beloved, the Bible is God's divine revelation to man. In other words, it's a wealth of information that's right at your fingertips. I've been studying this Bible now for nigh 50 years. And I got to tell you, I'm learning things left and right as I get older and older because none of us know it all. I call myself a scholarly student. That's what I am, a student. And the Holy Spirit is the teacher. I've learned more from the Holy Spirit than I ever learned in seminary. And that's the fact, beloved. I'm not just saying that. Because when I set out to something, I set out like a, a, a hound after a, a fox, and I wanted to know something. It was the Holy Spirit that kept bringing things to my, my memory and bringing me back. Oh, remember you read that in Jeremiah. Remember you read that in Isaiah. Remember in Lamentations, it was there also, Joel. That wasn't some teacher that taught me from a university or some teacher that taught me in the seminary. That was the Lord himself, the resident teacher, the Holy Spirit of the living God inside of me. Would you say amen? Because he's trying to give me a wealth of information of God's divine revelation. You see, beloved, the Bible is a moral and spiritual book. The Bible is a prophetic book. The Bible is a history book. I can't tell you, beloved, we don't have time for this really, but the archaeologist spade, listen to me, many of the pundits, those who have come against the Bible, have said the Bible cannot be the word of God because many of the towns that it mentions, especially Nazareth, are not even on the map. We don't know anything historically about a place called Nazareth. But the Bible mentions it, doesn't it? 
Well, you know, beloved, now we have discovered Nazareth. It was a kibbutz of about 250 people, so there wasn't a lot of people there. And so that's why it would be like saying uh, 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 on Jordan Road, uh, the, you know, God was working on Jordan Road, and most people say, Jordan Road, who cares about Jordan Road? But if they said downtown Boston, all of a sudden everything would open up. You see, but the Bible predicted, the Bible talked about a place called Nazareth, that was where Jesus grew up, and yet the archae it took the archaeologist's spade to prove what the Bible had already said years ago. Imagine that. And many things. For example, one of the things I had to settle when I came to the Lord was how come, as I looked at the extant ready, reading, uh, writings of the day, that means outside of the Bible, how come none of them mention the babies being slain in Bethlehem? Now, if that happened today, it would be on the news every night, wouldn't it? Well, I started digging and studying and reading, and then it dawned on me. As I was reading one day, as I was studying about Bethlehem, I was looking at my encyclopedias, Bethlehem, was, there were probably 150 people there. If there were 150 people there, and most people had grown up with, there'd probably be six or seven babies there. So we're thinking that 5,000 babies were slain, but it was. It was probably no more than 20, not that that isn't a lot. But it wasn't something that would make headline news in the ancient world. You see what I'm saying? So I was able to settle that in my heart, exactly uh, what the, this Bible is truly historic. It means what it says. It says what it means. Would you say amen out there? Now, the Bible is also a science book. Now, it doesn't mean it gives you everything you need to know about science, but every place it speaks scientifically, it is perfectly uh, accurate. I, I told you, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, the scientific thought of the day is that the world was flat. But when Columbus went to uh, uh, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain and said, look, the world isn't flat, it's round. And he says, what are you, crazy Columbus? How do you know that it's so round? Because he says in Isaiah 42, and O king, you believe the Bible, you say, that he, is, he that sits upon the circle of the earth, the earth is round, I tell you. And that's how he got the funding to take the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria and come and found a Portuguese guy off of Plymouth. He said, where's America? He said, over there. <laughs> Probably my father or grandfather, right? The Bible's a cosmological book. When you st study about Pleiades and Orion, beloved, these constellations, you say, how in the world did they ever know things like that? And yet Job, the very first book of the Bible, mentions that. Would you say Amen. So what am I saying to you, beloved? I'm saying this Bible is a book that truthfully reveals that there is indeed a real heaven to gain and hell to shun. Not too many people want to talk about that. Very few books in the university want to talk about that, but this Bible says it's true. You see, this book says it's true. You need to seek him in his word. And beloved, listen to me now. It is a book that shows men how to be saved because they are terribly lost before God and they will split hell wide open if they don't come to Christ through the gospel. Now, there isn't too many books anywhere that will talk like that. And beloved, one of the ways you can know that the Bible is indeed the infallible word of God is because most other ancient writers, when they wrote about themselves, they lifted themselves, exalted themselves up. But the writers of the New Testament showed how sinful they were and how wicked they were before this holy man named Jesus. And so not too many people want to put that out before everybody and say, I'm just a wicked, no good, whatever. They want to build themselves up like a lot of people do today, don't they? So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this Bible will show you how to get saved, how to get right with God so you're not lost. And, beloved, it reveals God's divine person to us, his power, his providence, his precepts, his promises to us. And the more you know about the Bible, the more you know about God. I am sick and tired of people saying, well, I felt this little Gucci goo, or I had a vision whenever. Well, beloved, if you don't know the word of God, fool you on your vision. <laughs> fool you on your vision. You must take your vision and bring it in line with the word of God to see whether or not that's truly uh, God will speak to you. Amen. Because this is the standard, this is the canon, this is the rule, this is the measuring rod, whereby you find out whether or not that vision you had or that dream you had was indeed uh, from God. 
And so, beloved, I'm telling you, the Bible's a treasure trove of infallible moral and spiritual and ethical information and knowledge that applies to every area and aspect of our lives. Every area, beloved. Now, listen to me. It's filled with all kinds of stories, isn't it? And you can identify with a lot of them. It's filled with all kinds of illustrations, especially in the parables. You can say, wait a minute, wait a minute now. Parable. There's more here than meets the eye. There, there's a, a heavenly truth trying to convey an earthly truth to me. So I've got to think this thing through. Listen to me now, beloved. It is filled with poems. It is filled with truth and promises and principles and songs and blessings. And the Bible's filled with warnings and threats. It's filled with action and intrigue and real-life practical lessons and experience, beloved, that can indeed supernaturally transform your nature and your character and miraculously help you to morally and spiritually seek after God. Would you say amen out there? To help you morally and spiritually govern and guide your life so you're not condemned with the rest of the world. Because this world is going to hell in a handbasket, ladies and gentlemen. I hate to say that. When I see what's going on in this world today from the sexual promiscuity, from the perversion that's going on, from the injustice that's going on, I can only envision. And God's trying to get our attention with fires and pestilences and viruses and everything else. And everybody said 9-11 was a wake-up call. Not too many people woke up and stayed wake up, did they? Right back where we started again. And people think that America's not gonna, gonna, America's not going to come under the judgment hand of God, but beloved, we're already under it. Just not hot enough yet because God is merciful. And so God is dealing with the church. Remember, in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, it says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, then will I forgive their sin, then will I hear their land. He didn't say if the unsaved would do that. He said if the what? If my people would do that, if my church will do that, would humble themselves before me. And a lot of people are going to say, and I can hear it right now, standing up on the inside, sitting down on the outside. I'll see when I get there. You don't want that. I'm telling you as your friend and your pastor, you don't want that. You want to settle this issue right now. You, you don't want to say that. I'll put it off to the day of judgment. You don't want to do that. Oh, the Bible is not true because the Bible warns us against that. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, there's verses in this book that apply to just what you're going through right now in your life. You know, we're all cut from the same bolt of cloth. I was telling a doctor that uh, uh, last week. I said, we're all cut from the same bolt of cloth. We like to think that we're a little better than the other person. But if you only had one little sin in your life, you'd be damned as much as the other person. You see, we're all cut from that same bolt of cloth. Amen. So this book, beloved, can show you how to enter into the eternal kingdom of God. And this is the best book on marriage and counseling in the world. This is the best book. In fact, I, was, I read the book of Proverbs uh, yesterday, and I was just making a chain about how to train up a child. And I went through all the different uh, scriptures there, beloved, but I won't quote it right now because that's where I, I don't want to go there. But it's the best book to show you how to raise your children. Not Dr. Spock, not the unsaved psychologist, not the unsaved psychiatrist. This book, who are made in God's image, God's likeness, he knows exactly how to train up his children. Would you say amen out there? And, beloved, this book is the best book on courting and dating. Now, you don't see too much courting today, you turn the TV on, people, I always say to my wife, turn the station, we're watching a show and all of a sudden they get really hug each other, they rip their shirt off, I just, imagine that, you just met somebody and immediately you're ripping your shirt off, right? That's courting? No, beloved, you, you can see how the world has sexually perverted what is true. So I'm saying to you that if you want to learn how to truly court and how to date, you need to read this book. So if you get your nose in the book, beloved, I guarantee you, and you constantly practice what it preaches and teaches, then there'll never be a failed marriage, then there'll never be a broken home, then there'll never be a rebellious child. But you must practice. Don't be a hypocrite. Remember, your children are watching you. You can say the right words and do the wrong things, and that's what they'll do, follow. And you go home and talk about this person, that person, this person, that person, the great, the preacher. What do you think you're doing to your kids? 
Think they'll have any respect for the preacher? Anything for the message? You want to do that? Go outside and let God, I'll let God deal with you on that one, okay? But you hear me now. God says to you that you are indeed a real wise man if you diligently seek to read and to study and to know him and obey his holy word, beloved. You see, it's God's moral and spiritual milk and meat for our soul, isn't it? How are you going to feed your soul? By TV? By the social media? How do you feed your soul? I need to go to the book. I need to go where the food is. How about you? God's book, beloved, is a book of soul food. You know, before there was a soul man. See, God already had the soul food for that soul man. Would you say amen out of Detroit? And beloved, it, it's a book of moral and spiritual nourishment that strengthens and sustains our soul and spirit. Listen to me now. You don't eat food one time to sustain your body. You must continuously eat food to strengthen and sustain your body. Nothing's different with the Bible. You're gonna, if you want to sustain your soul and your spirit and strengthen it, you need to stay in the book. Beloved, listen to me. You kids, you listen to me. The things you're pursuing right now are going to burn up But when Christ comes back. The only thing you got going for you is what you've dedicated and pursued after the Lord. That's the only thing you have. So you need to get your priorities. I told you last week, the priority and pursuit of diligently seeking God in your life. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, what God's looking for is spiritually mature and grown-up Christians. Adult Christians. Not little babies that always have to rattle their things, and God doesn't do this, and God doesn't do that. And little babies always rattling, God, 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 don't, don't, don't. Me, 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 I, I, I. See, God says, listen, I want an adult Christian. It takes the good, the bad, and the indifferent. The good, bad, and the ugly. The ups and downs, the all-arounds, because that's what life is. We're in a fallen world. A sinful world, but yet we have hope because the Bible says God is our hope. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, that's why there's so many immature Christians both in and out of the church and so many Christians with little wisdom in and out of the church because they do not read or study or obey the Bible. The word has not become part of their moral and spiritual makeup and their character yet. So they think a curse of reading, oh yeah, I got my chapter in today, is going to do it. But beloved, you won't. Remember, real wise men still seek him in the word. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, real wise men know God's word will save and sanctify them. And they know it will constantly justify them and sanctify and glorify and strengthen them and empower them, ladies and gentlemen. That this word is the only book. This book is the only word, I should say. Well, you know what I mean. But it will supernaturally and enlighten and illuminate your mind. I said supernaturally. Not naturally. Supernaturally. Via the person of the Holy Ghost. Would you say amen out there? So daily, the real wise man knows he needs to read God's word. So daily, the real wise man knows he must study God's word and he loves God's word and he must live God's word and he must obey God's word. Real wise men can now say like King David in Psalm 119, 97, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day long. Would you say amen? If you truly love the word, when you come to that passage in Psalm 119, beloved, you just said, that's me. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And I put long. <laughs> okay. That's what he means anyways. That's the Portuguese version. So what is it, beloved, that you daily meditate on? What is it that you daily fix and focus your attention on? Is it God? Is it God's word, beloved? If so, then God says, you are a real wise man. Amen. So you seek God in worship, you seek his word. Thirdly, beloved, you must seek his will. Diligently seek his will. Real wise men diligently seek his will. You know, beloved, if you diligently seek to do the Lord's will in your life and not your own will, God says, you're starting to learn something right now. You're starting to see that I know a lot more about you and your life and the plans I've made for your life than you do. When you seek my will, when you diligently seek to do 
my will, you are starting to get wise in your life. Amen? You know, Jesus taught us how to pray to God in the Lord's Prayer. He said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, in heaven, God's will is perfectly done. So what is he saying? The goal is to try to get us to correspond to God's will, to conform to God's will, to be transformed by God's will while we're on this earth. Would you say amen out there? In Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 6, the Apostle Paul exhorts us, he says, to do God's will from the heart. Romans 12, 2 commands us to be not conformed to this world, but be schemazoed. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Would you say amen out there? You see, folks, God has supernaturally endowed and equipped every one of us. Now you say, wow, wow, wow. Well, listen to what I'm going to say before you go blinkity, blackity, blinkity, black, 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 and swear at me. This is what I'm going to say to you, ladies and gentlemen. Real wise men diligently seek to renew their mind so they can know what God's will is and they can do God's good and acceptable and perfect will of God is in their lives. In other words, God has supernaturally endowed and equipped every one of us with special gifts, special talents, special, special gifts, beloved, so we can do that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You have different gifts than I do and I have different gifts than you do. That's why the Bible says when he talks about the gifts, the charismata, in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, that block of scripture, it says that all the gifts are to profit with all. To what? To profit with all. Not just for you so you can enjoy it, it's so I can enjoy your gift and you can minister to me and you can enjoy my gift as I minister to you. Would you say amen out there? We're like baking biscuits, I told you. You have to put all, I don't like flour by itself. I don't like salt by itself. Uh, eggs, I stew, I love eggs by itself. But, uh, but beloved, when you mix them all together and you get some biscuits, I love biscuits. How about you? You see, so you have to mix all of these things together, all of the gifts together, so God can make his biscuits in the church. And we need to do that in our life, beloved, so we can minister to the church, so we can minister to the world, and especially so we can minister to each other. We'll never be totally happy You'll never feel completely satisfied. You will never fo find fulfillment in your life until you finally reside and say, Lord, I want to know your will. I want to do your will. I want your will on me. I want your will in me, with me, and through me. I want to know your will. Would you say amen out there? But you see, beloved, I'm being proactive here, not reactive, right? You have to Say, Lord, beloved, if my wife kisses me in the morning and I don't kiss her back, I mean, what kind of relationship would that be? Every morning, <laughs> let the cat out of the bag, I hug my wife and I kiss her. And I said, I miss you. She says, it was only, we slept last night. <laughs> I miss you, baby. In other words, I'm trying to keep the fire alive, right? There's a fire in the sea. There may be some snow on the roof, but there's a cold in the stove. <laughs> But you see, beloved, that we're interacting with one another. You just don't get married and say, okay, well, I do, and then you love each other forever and ever. That's not it. You work at it, amen? And you want to do things that are pleasing. I'm saying that you'll never find true happiness in your life. You'll never find true pleasure and success in your job or in your career or in your pursuits and relationships until you diligently see God and find out and accept and pursue his good and acceptable and perfect will for your life that he's divinely equipped you with, with those special gifts and talents and skills he gave you to serve him. Oh, listen to me, beloved. We're not smart enough to know exactly what our personal niche and calling in life is that will make us feel completely happy and fulfilled till... We find God's will for our life, that divinely appointed vocation and occupation and profession and that place and that position in our life that God has called us to and equipped us to. I never thought in my life I'd ever be a preacher. I never. I thought when I did become a preacher, I thought I'd be an evangelist, not a pastor. But see, God reveals those...
the plan in your life as you start pursuing that plan and he starts cutting away at everything else and I found that, gee, well, you know what? I enjoy preaching more, more than I do anything else. If I couldn't preach, beloved, I'd just as soon die. I love being God's mouthpiece. I love proclaiming, pro proclaiming his word. Now, you may not like it, okay, but I do. And I believe that's the gift that God has given me. Now, that doesn't mean my gift is higher than your gift, but you need to do the same with your gift as I've done with mine. I've tried to hone it. I've tried to make sure that I know the Word of God. I've tried to make sure that I memorize the Word of God. I've tried to make sure that I know the doctrines of God. So I can minister first, or on the day of judgment, I'll give an account to him, but I can minister to you the truth of the Word of God. Amen? Now, a lot of people say to me this. They say, Pastor Joel, how do I know what God's will is for my life. Now that sounds like a reasonable question, isn't it? Because we know what we want to do. We're attracted to a lot of things in this world. See, the world gives you everything that glit and glitters, doesn't it? To get your attention, to get your attention, to divert you away from this. But I've had to learn to step back a piece and say, okay, God, what is it you want me to do? What is it? What are the skills? What is your will for my life? You know, I said that to God one day, and as I was reading the Gospel of St. John, it seemed like it no sooner got out of my mouth that I came across John 7, 17, where Jesus said, If a man will to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. In other words, he'll know what his will is, he'll know what's true, he'll know the doctrine, beloved, and he'll know what God has called you to in his word because he's the one that's equipped you to do it. Amen? If any man will to do his will, do you will to do that? Or do you will to do your will? Well, this titillates my flesh. I like that. How about titillating God? What is God's will for your life? You're never going to be happy till you do it. You will all be, always be chasing things. Well, I want to try this, and I'm bored with that, and I want to try that, and I'm bored with this, and I had this, but this doesn't really satisfy me, and I want to try this, and I want, and you're like a ship on the water without a rudder. Every way the wind blows, you're going this way, that way, whatever, never going where you need to go, that final destination. Amen? So, beloved, as you read the Word of God, you find that the psalmist many times was in the same position that we are. He wanted to know, Lord, I'm so confused. What is your will for my life? I want to know your will for my life. And in Psalm 143.10, he prayed. Listen to what he said. Lord, and he said this from the heart, he said, Lord, teach me to do thy will. For thou art my God, thy spirit is good, leadeth me into the land of uprightness. Meaning the psalmist understood he needed God's divine guidance to do his will, and so don't you and I. We need his will. We need his guidance. See, he, he, he says here, Lord, lead me to do thy will. Thy spirit will lead me. He had confidence that God's spirit was going to lead him. Do you have that confidence? Have you ever prayed that prayer? When I read the Psalms, I always put my, I insert my name in there, try to apply it to myself. Help me, Lord. I put myself right where the psalmist is, where David is, where Asaph is. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying... You and I both need God's divine guidance in our life to find our true calling. Lord, teach me to do thy will. I want to know that ministry, that job, that occupation, that place of profession that you want me to be. And beloved, you have to pray, Lord, give me a willing heart to do it. Give me a fervent desire to do it. Give me the courage and the, the uh, ability to recognize and do what you have appointed me to do. So Lord, it's not my will be done in my life but it is thy will be done in my life. Hey, you self-acclaimed wise men out there, have you ever done that? Have you ever prayed like this before your God? Are you truly willing to submit and surrender your will to God's divine will in your life? Now, you kids ought to listen to what I'm saying here because you're watching TV and there's things that may be interesting to you, and you say, you know what, that looks like fun. I'm going to pursue it. But you know what you haven't done? You haven't checked to see whether or not that's God's will in your life yet. Because I told you, Satan's a wily foe. 
He loves to tempt you. All the glint and glitter of the world, doesn't he? To divert, divert your attention. Beloved, imagine all the wasted years. I know in my life, I look back and I said, Lord, why didn't I come to the Lord sooner? I wasted 24 years of my life before I came to know the Lord. And I wish I had it. Don't you wish you could buy back 24 years, ladies and gentlemen? I don't want to waste my life like that, and I know you don't want to do that either. You know, when we're left to ourselves, all of us make terrible decisions. We make shabby choices in our life. When you're left to yourself, you make awful mistakes in your life. But a wise man says, you know what? I want to do your will, Lord God, and I will listen to your spirit, and I'll do it even though it's not what I want to do, but I want to do what you want me to do, and I know why I do that. You're going to bless me. Would you say amen? Because I'm trusting what you say. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. A wise man knows that this is a brand new year. A wise man knows, a real wise man, that, hey, he can have a fresh start, a fresh thing, a new year with God, and he can leave his troubled and tumultuous past behind him, like Paul did. Beloved, listen to me. Paul, in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, he said this. He said, we're to forget those things which are behind. That's our past, isn't it? And he says, we ought to reach forth unto those things that are before. That's our present right now. And then he says, and I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's our future. Bless God, that's this new year. That's this new year, isn't it? Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Of course, the ultimate prize is to enter into the kingdom of God. Would you say amen out there? So the real wise men know that they can start over again with God. It's not a matter of how old you are. Any stage and age of your life, you can start right here, right now today, and change your life. But you have to want to. God will never force us to do, do something against our, uh, our will, will he? You can't have true love or true worship if you're forced. So God tells us what he wants. You're a real wise man if you worship God. You're a real wise man if you study his word and you try to do his will because, beloved, God says if you do that, you are a wise man. Listen to me. You're not too old to start again. Do you know that uh, Enoch was 65 years old when he decided to walk with God? And he walked for the next 300 years. Okay, 365 years, and then God took him. He was no more. Abraham was 75 years old. Noah was over 500 years old. Moses began his lucrative career at 80. <laughs> 80 years of age. You're never too old to serve God. I've said, Lord, when you're ready to take me, I play it's after the sermon because I don't want to be embarrassed dropping dead in front here afterwards. Like, but I, if I can't be used of you anymore, then take me off the scene. I'm ready to go to glory. So uh, I'm saying that to you because a lot of you are saying it's too old. Beloved, let me tell you something. I don't care if you're 20 years old, 30 years old. Far. You're, you're, just a, you're just a young upside. You're a blip on the radar screen of eternity. So get to work. Get to work doing what God wants you to do. So that's my fourth point. Not only... Uh, worship and work, uh, I mean word and will, beloved, but the fourth thing, God wants you to diligently work. Diligently do his work. God is our divine commander-in-chief, and we're the soldiers in the Lord's army. And we get our marching orders from him, amen? In scripture, God tells us to redeem the time because the days are evil. Buy back the time. Lord, I know I don't have much time left, so I'm going to do whatever I can right now. In scripture... The Bible says to occupy until I come, until Jesus Christ comes back. Would you say amen out there? So God says, I want you to occupy until I come. God says in the scripture, I want you to get busy working for me. You say, I have to get into the ministry. Beloved, wherever you are is a ministry for God. Turn it into a ministry through your life, through your testimony, through your words, whatever it may be. That can be the testimony. That can be the work that God is calling you to. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, these are our marching orders, and they come directly from God. Hey, Christian soldier, soldier, listen to me. That sound like you. You trying to do the Lord's work in your life? Are you busy about the business trying to labor for the Lord? 
You see, you're a real wise man if you diligently seek to preach the gospel to people. And you're a real wise man if you decide to serve the Lord. And beloved, you're a real wise man if you labor for the Lord, you do the Lord's work, you try to minister to people, and you try to build up the church. Remember, the church is the body and bride and building of Christ. When you, you're not doing it for Pastor Joel, you're doing it for the Lord. And so you want to build up the church, not tear it down in your life. Amen? And so God says, I want you to get to work. Get to work. Get to work out there. And advance the kingdom of God on this earth. You know, God's keeping a record in heaven. Every good thing we do, the Bible says the recording angel writes it down. Why does God do that? Because he wants to condemn you? No. He wants to make sure you get your full reward. Amen? Lord, I forgot when I passed out this track, and I forgot when I helped that person. I forgot when I... God said, I didn't. I wrote it down. Angel, come over here. And he says, look, you're right here. And all of a sudden, you look, he's got a book filled with it. You know, it'll be like this here. You don't want to have blank pages between the covers. Okay? Oh, wow. I forgot that. God says, I didn't. I forgot. I, I didn't forget that one. Look at that. I can't believe you did that one, Joel. Neither can I, Lord. <laughs> Many a time I say to my, my wife, you have a sleepless night and you have to go out in the middle of the night. I said, Lord, this is for you. The last thing I want to do is get out of a warm bed and get dressed and go out and do what I have to do and get all fired up and come back home and it's 4.30 in the morning. You say, Lord, how do I shut it off so I can get some sleep? And you can't do it. But Lord, I did it for you. I did it for them too. But primarily what got me out of bed was doing it for the Lord. How about you? You see, beloved, uh, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here, that God will greatly reward you for teaching that Sabbath school class. And it blessed my heart when I saw the choir this morning. You know God's going to reward you for singing in the choir? And God says, sing with all of your heart to me. Don't just come up here, whatever, and well, you sing it from the bottom of your heart. And God will reward you. And God will reward you for working in the nursery, the crying ministry. And God will reward you for cleaning up the church and passing out tracts and helping your brothers and sisters in need and in deed. And when we have work day and you show up instead of thinking somebody else is going to do it. No, you need to be there. You say, but I, 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 how do I do this, Lord? You know, I'm so tired. Brother, listen to me. You serve the Lord when you're tired. Never convenient to serve the Lord. That's when the rubber meets the road. That's when you find out who uh, separate the men from the boys or the Ladies from the girls, when you do, instead of saying, ah, no big thing, hey, beloved, serving God is no big thing, I hope you don't have that attitude. Beloved, listen to me, someday we're all going to die. We're all going to pass off the scene. And the only thing that will enter into eternity with you will be your works. That's the only thing. You hear me now, bless God, beloved, you won't regret one bit your sacrificial service to the Lord. Personally, beloved, I don't regret one bit my sacrifice in service to the Lord as your pastor all these years. I don't. And beloved, I don't regret the long hours of counseling. And I don't regret the long hours of years of studying and preparing and traveling and preaching and teaching, beloved, often until I lost my voice. Of course, I didn't like losing my voice, but my wife loved it. <laughs> oh, gee, Joe, you can't talk. I'm so tired. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. <laughs> but, beloved, I don't regret it one bit. You see, I know, I know that I'm trying to do what? I'm trying to store up heavenly treasure. How about you? When's the last time you put some treasure up in heaven? And, beloved, I don't regret those sleepless nights either. And you won't regret anything that you ever do for the Lord. Everything else in this world is going to burn up when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, but not our works. Oh, hear me now, beloved. Your house will burn up when Jesus comes back. Your car and your job and your clothes will burn up when Jesus comes back. Your furniture, all your material possessions that you have, that you hold so near and dear to you, they're all going to burn up when Jesus comes back. But not your works. But, ladies and gentlemen, not your labor and service for the Lord. So you're a real wise man to diligently seek to do God's work in your life. Amen? And lastly, beloved, one last thing I want to give you before I close this out. Not only do we want to 
serve God and diligently seek him and worship him in his word and his will and his work. But lastly, beloved, his ways. His ways. You know, the Bible says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. The Bible says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, beloved, someday, listen to me now, real wise men are going to say, you know what? I am so pleased that I brought my ways into conformity to God's ways. When I look back now, when you get to heaven, see, now your life is 20 20. 20, you, you, you know, beloved, we can't look ahead with 2020 vision, but we can look back with 2020 vision, can't we? And someday God's going to allow us to do that, to look back over our life with 2020 vision. And you're a real wise man if you diligently seek to know and do the right ways of the Lord. In Psalm 1830, the Bible says, As for God, his ways are perfect. So, beloved, what do we need to do? We need to bring our life, our mind, our thoughts, our desires into harmony and conformity to the lordship and law and leading of God's way, both in and through our life. In Psalm 145, the, gospel, the Bible states that the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all of his works. So, beloved, God says, you want to do my will? Yes, we'll separate from the world. What, Lord? You want to do my will? Yes, Lord. Then I want you to separate and be apart from carnality and materialism in this world and anything and everything else that you know will draw you away from my way and will and word and work in your life. Amen? You see, beloved, God knows that the real wise man is looking forward to the coming of the second advent. In Titus 2.13, it says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And I say, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Anathema to those who don't want the Lord to come. Because that's what Paul said, didn't he? That they love not the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, beloved, you're a real wise man if you're waiting for the Lord right now. You're a real wise man if you're watching for the Lord right now, and you're working for the Lord right now, and you're longing for the word, uh, Lord right now to come. And you're worshiping him, and you're trying to bring your ways in conformity to his ways. Amos went before the church in, them, uh, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament Jews, and he said in Amos chapter 4 and verse 12, he says, it's time to prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet thy God. Do you do that? Do you prepare to meet your God? What do you do every day to prepare to meet your God? You see, beloved, some of you may need to pray up so you'll be prepared to meet your God. Some of you need to pay up. Why well, miss church for three weeks? I'll tell you what. First thing I said to my wife, I said, you give our tithe and offering, you put it in the till. That's God's money. Will a man rob God? Oh, how do we rob you? In tithe and offering. That's God's money. Amen? So some of you need to pray up. Some of you need to pay up. Some of you may need to wake up or stand up or fess up if you need to do any of these things and do it now while you still have time to do it, beloved. So you'll be ready for the coming of the Lord and perhaps it will be this new year. This new year, beloved, are you ready? Wise men are always ready. Now let me close with this. It's been said this, that a wasted life is no more than a collection of wasted days, one day at a time. Do you hear what I just said? God gives each of us, beloved, the exact number of days to start every new year. He gives you and I, everyone, 365 days, which means there's 365 opportunities in those days ahead of us so we can change our circumstances and direction we're going and start living a productive life for God. Amen? All depending upon the decisions and the actions that we make in our life. That's what it means. 
You can have a waste of, take your days and throw them away. I'm just going to waste my days. I'm going to bide my time. You see, beloved, we can choose to either invest in doing eternal things that bring eternal rewards in heaven, or in just doing earthly things that will bring us no rewards from God in heaven, beloved. In other words, there'll be temporal things, and perhaps someday those temporal things may land you in hell. We can choose to either be consumed in worshiping and living for the Lord or being consumed with this evil world system and living for ourselves. And beloved, we can either choose to diligently take advantage of every occasion God has given us to serve him and please him with the gifts he's given them, or we can let these things drift away and let them pass, pass us by in our life, never to recover them again. What's your ministry for the Lord? What's your service for the Lord? Are you serving, storing up heavenly treasure in your life, beloved? What are you going to do with this new year before you? You see, beloved, if you take the former and you start investing in eternal things, beloved, you're making an eternal and lasting investment for you. If you do the latter and invest in earthly things, beloved, you're eternally divesting yourself of any hope whatsoever. Amen? So the difference between those who succeed and those who fail this new year is not found in their talents, but in their choices they'll make and in the actions that they'll take. Amen? Amen? Amen. You see, the real wise men will diligently seek to put forth effort to store up treasure in heaven for all eternity, whereas the unwise man who don't and won't will just continue to waste his time, waste his days that God has given him this year. So, beloved, it's up to each and every one of us to get busy either living or get busy dying in our life. Each and every person, now listen to me, these are original thoughts and they're tough ones, you know. Each and every person is the sum total of their own personal choices and decisions and actions in their life, good, bad, and indifferent. I'm saying, beloved, you are now what you've chosen to be and you are now where you've chosen to be. You've chosen it. You've got no one else to give credit to or no one else to blame. You're the one that made those decisions. You knew, like I do, I know what God wants me to do. The Holy Spirit shows me sometimes, but you want to lift up the heel and make all kinds of excuses. Amen. So, beloved, no one else is to blame for it. So my question to you this morning is this, as we enter this new year. As a real wise man... You need to get on your knees today and say, Lord, I want to make responsible choices, responsible decisions, and responsible actions. Because I know all eternity is at stake. And I want to have something. I want to have crowns to take off my head that you've given me so I can throw them at your feet when I go to glory. Because that's what the Bible says we're going to do, amen? We're going to take our crowns that he's given us and throw them at his feet. My question is this, are you a real wise man? I hope you can say amen, preacher. Beloved, don't dismiss this. I put a lot of energy effort to this because I believe it's so important because we're getting closer, ever so close to the coming of the Lord. Paul said the Christ's coming is nearer now than we first believed. Imagine it is right now, beloved, 2,000 years later. So there's some decision you have to make this year. Don't go blaming it on this person and that person, whatever. God will lead you wherever you need to go. If he closes one door, what will he do? He'll open another door. In other words, you may think you're going that way, but God said, that's not where I wanted you to go. That's why I had that, providentially had that door closed. Prali, Portuguese, over there. He's Porto de Parqui. This door over here. Amen. Are you a real wise man? Let's go to the throne of grace.